I'm, I'm here with a very engaging leader, Dan Hart. He's president and CEO of Virgin Orbit. Uh, Dan, thank you for being here. Hey, well, it's great to be with you, Jason, and it's great to it's be great at the to be Space at the Innovation East. Summit. Well, I um, look forward to uh, several uh, upcoming launches. What you're doing is very exciting and um, very, very uh, proud of all the successes that you're having. Um, today, I uh, talked a little bit about responsive space this morning and what Virgin Orbit is doing with Launcher One is an incredible asset to supporting responsive launch. There's several companies that tout responsive launch capabilities, but what Virgin Orbit is doing is bringing it to market and this is something that has otherwise been missing. Um, so um, that, that's my question. That's, that leads me to my question. Uh, you know, what has the market um, been missing and what impact will what Virgin Orbit's bringing to the table have? Well, you know, of course there's, there's various segments in, in, um, in the uh, space launch and, and small spacecraft uh, markets. You know, looking at national security in particular, there's an opportunity here to change and add, frankly, to the mindset and the toolkits that are available um, to the commander. Uh, you know, our, our tradition, and you know this so well from, from your, uh, you know, leadership of, of spacecraft, but I mean, uh, the tradition has always been to take a half a decade or a decade and plan of what we might need in space and then something happens on the ground and incredibly talented and brilliant engineers and leaders adapt to that. And they make best use of by moving assets or getting slant angles or changing frequencies. And that has worked well for us, but there's a new capability now. Um, you know, what if, what if when something happened on the ground, you could put the right asset at the right time to the right place? And the commander had the kind of flexibility that we have with, well, you know, drones or, or other forces today. And that's what we're talking about, where a, a Ukraine happens and all of a sudden we can have exactly the right assets up at the right place. Or if an asset is uh, for some reason disabled, we can get another asset up um, pretty much immediately, uh, you know, not in years, not in months. Um, but in days or hours. And so for national security, that's, that's a key capability. And I think, you know, from a commercial standpoint, as large constellations go up that have availability needs, similar kinds of responsiveness, you know, maybe not exactly the same, but similar, are also going to be very valuable. Well, uh, you've convinced me this is such a critical piece to the defense of space. Um, now, drawing on your personal experience with government satellites and now with launch, what types of missions do you think responsive launch will transform with the greatest impact? Well, it really goes across the mission area. I mean, well, first of all, I've, I've long been the believer that the most resilient satellite is the one that hasn't been launched yet. The one that hasn't been uh, become a, a slave to Kepler, gone to a regular orbit, studied by the adversary, characterized and potentially targeted. And so, you know, you think about the, the potential of a satellite that's in the barn that you could put to any orbit at any time from anywhere, um, you know, it really cuts across most mission areas. So Earth observation and, and you know, intelligence or, or tactical awareness, uh, GPS augmentation, um, you know, a lot of discussions about GPS jamming or vulnerability, comms. Um, different frequencies, different capabilities. So, you know, I really think the, the idea of being able to respond this way cuts across. Yeah, it really seems like tactical missions will be greatly impacted by your capabilities and responsive space. So I'm um, looking forward to uh, many partnerships there. Um, and responsive space, is, it's really about on-demand space support, like you said. Uh, generally speaking, we need an architecture that supports allied partnerships and Virgin Orbit has shared a lot about building out global spaceport architectures. And um, what exactly does that offer customers? What value does it have for the defense community? Well, first of all, you know, space um, is becoming a regional or more of a distributed national value. 
I mean, every country in the world almost is starting to wake up and say, you know, there's a growing space economy. I want to be part of it. There is a national capability for my national security and understanding of the world that that I need to have and from space. I mean, you know, with the tragic activity in Ukraine, what amazes me is everyone in the world almost has become a satellite imagery analyst. You know, I'll be sitting on the couch and, with my wife and she's saying, you know, is that a tank or a troop carrier? Um, these are discussions that used to happen only in, you know, small rooms or large rooms that were dark with big lights. Um, and now we're all doing it. So the value is, is very, very clear. Um, there's, um, there's, there are spacecraft uh, companies popping up in countries around the world. And so now the question becomes, you know, what about launch? Because you can't really be a fully spacefaring nation without the ability to get to space. And the ability to respond, to not have to wait online uh, in another country is a value that our allies have, and they would like to have capability, and they would they want to collaborate across the allied countries, across the United States, and and balance out and 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 have a space capability where they're sharing some of the load, they're getting capability from other countries. There's a whole new era of collaboration happening for us, given that we can turn any airport into a spaceport pretty much overnight. Um, the opportunity is to be is to be the service for launch for our allied countries and and to give them capability that's on site. So they have airplanes and and they have uh, the infrastructure to support uh, an incredibly flexible capability that working in tandem with our space force, our intelligence community, I think is is the future. Where, where allies can, can be launching, we're launching, we're coordinating, we're making use of on-orbit on assets together. Um, it's, it's a much uh, stronger and more integrated approach to, um, to a safer world. So, uh, you know, I personally have heard a lot about, you know, Virgin Orbit's capability to launch from a single spaceport internationally, but um, can Virgin Orbit facilitate the interoperability of the launch services between multiple international spaceports at the same time for a more simultaneous coordinated operation between allies? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, and it starts with the kind of mobility and flexibility that I mentioned, but then it gets back down into the, well, if I can, the bowels of the system. You know, we have a system where four people on an airplane can perform a space launch. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty lean, nicely automated system. And we have a centralized mission control center where we can coordinate, collaborate. So uh, we've got the ability to support, um, you know, launches across the world. And, and we would like to, as we go forward, have more and more um, in-country involvement so that these are independent systems. Um, I think the collaboration is great. Uh, more like, a, you know, airplanes flying around that that Airbus and Boeing and, and others support on a daily basis. It sounds like uh, what you're doing with these interoperable allied launch services are gonna be key to responsive space. And uh, switching gears a bit, um, there's a lot of new start launch companies out there. Uh, just in your backyard, I count, I don't know, six of them. Uh, with so many ground launch vehicles offering small satellite rideshare services, how is Virgin Orbit differentiated in the competitive field for everybody? Well, first of all, there's a huge amount of innovation going on in the industry, and, and that is fantastic. And we're training an entire generation of space-capable, space-savvy professionals. And, and that will be one of the biggest things that comes out of, of this era. When we look at um, launch, you know, as you mentioned, I mean, we're doing something different, uh, you know, liquid rockets off of an air launch platform 18 months ago or so was the first time in history it ever happened. It happened through us in, in Southern California. It was the first time anybody launched to orbit from Southern California. Um, it's a unique capability. The economics are unique in that the airplane takes some of the load and gets the rocket to 30, 35,000 feet, the better part of Mach 1 and most of the way through the atmosphere before the rocket has to do any work. 
It makes for a simpler rocket. Um, it gives us range uh, flexibility where we can fly, for instance, like we did about, a, about 10 days ago uh, from California to an orbit that you can't fly to from California. Uh, we did a 45 degree inclination and that's, um, that's something you would normally have to go to the Cape for, for instance. Uh, we had uh, the Polish um, uh, delegation here in March uh, in the middle of the Ukraine crisis. And the comment from the head of their space agency was your technology to reach orbits is the only way we could ever do launch out of Poland. Um, and other countries, because we can open up the aperture, if you will. We can fly through weather that, that ground launch rockets can't fly through. Um, uh, the launch uh, before this one was through 10,000 feet of turbulent clouds. Something, you know, a lightning trigger con concerns for ground launch would, would ground you typically. Uh, 747s have been flying through that weather for five decades or more. So there's, there's robustness and flexibility and then there's this ability to transport and fly from anywhere to any orbit at any time and do it unpredictably. And, and from a national security point of view, that unpredictability is key. Um, it, it adds um, an extra calculus that the adversary needs to consider um, and can serve as a deterrent, uh, as well as an important tool um, if there is conflict. What Virgin Orbit has done creating an agile, flexible, robust, resilient, responsive launch capability uh, from an airplane in the 747 is, is groundbreaking. Actually, it's uh, Dan, it's air breaking. Uh, it's been amazing to watch your team's success. And uh, speaking of small satellites, the kind that you launch, um, proliferated LEO constellations can serve an important role in supporting national strategic interests. We've clearly seen this at Millennium how does Virgin Orbit play into the national security space proliferated constellation strategy? Well, I mean, the prolifer proliferated space strategy um, is a great move. And, um, you know, again, again, the leadership, Jason, that you provide in, in, in driving that forward uh, is, is helping the whole community. Um, you know, those those constellations, and, and I mean, General Hyten said a few years ago, you know, no more big juicy targets, uh, and was quoted, the whole idea of distributed gives the ability to withstand a certain amount of, uh, of down or, 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 if you will, a first punch, um, and be able to adapt and not lose capability if you lose a satellite. Uh, the ability, so, so having that as a, a foundation really changes the game. Um, and it allows us to uh, do a lot what the commercial community is also doing, which is field technology improvements in incrementally. And, and there's so many benefits to that. Um, what we're doing is providing the capability to maintain a capability there so that you don't have to put a whole constellation full of spares at the same time. We can, we can support it through O&M. Um, we can respond quickly if part of the constellation is, is damaged. And then you sort of need a backup. I'm a big believer in layered systems um, for national security. And so you also need the capability to where if the system is affected in a bad way on a bad day, that you have capability for the commander and you can get um, tactical ability quickly. Uh, you can also augment a constellation that may be covering the entire globe if you've got a region that you want to support harder, um, you can add more capability and augment. So, you know, the flexibility that we bring has all those attributes and flexibility is, is the name of the game as we, as we you know, work in space in a, in a changing time. Yeah, I resonate with that. Flexibility is the key to space power, right? Um, Absolutely. And, uh, you know, you give me a lot of ideas here, Dan. Uh, there, there's a big difference between a company with an idea for a rocket and a company who can actually put something in orbit. Like there's a common theme with who I've been talking to this morning, which is you've done it. You've, you've actually demonstrated the capability and uh, it's becoming more routine and reliable. Um, and supporting government as an anchor customer can help with that success clearly. But when do you think it's the right time for government to get involved with new ventures? You know, I think 
that government needs to operate very much the way entrepreneurial um, companies or organizations uh, operate. And that is by continually looking for the next idea and adapting the strategy they have as technology and ideas emerge. And I, you know, if I look at, um, you know, the great organizations that have done that, whether it's the technology firms, you know, like Google or Apple, if I think about, you know, what Richard Branson has done in Virgin, um, if I look at, you know, large corporations that have been most successful, they, they don't have a static strategy. They're continually looking for an, an idea and nurturing it. And I think that uh, government needs to evaluate, select, nurture, and incorporate on a cyclical basis. And with what's happening in the commercial world, there's enormous opportunity right now. I mean, because there's capital coming in, there are ideas that are, that are being developed. Um, there is that chasm of death that we've all learned about, you know, where you go into R&D or you get into develop, development and to full scale uh, production and government can be a, a major source of strength in pushing across that. We are we are incredibly proud um, of the team here in, in I mean, we've had four successful missions now in 18 months. Uh, which, you know, starts to feel like a nice pattern. Um, and so we're in the process of ramping up. Um, we, our last mission was a DOD mission uh, in entirety. We, had, we did launch DOD satellites as part of payload before that. Um, and we're incredibly excited about working both with DOD um, as well as NASA and the intelligence community as we push through, you know, the, the classic kind of LRIP uh, into full-fledged, I don't know if launch is ever completely routine. They always have their own personality launches, but um, a regular cadence and a regular support, both domestically as well as internationally. Yeah, I like the name of the last launch you did. That was that was fantastic, and uh, the story behind it. So the question is, you know, when are you going to let me name one of your launches, Dan? Well, you know, you got to, you know, we've been naming our launches off of tunes that came out in um, on Virgin Records. Okay, so that's that's the standard that we've established. Um, you know, we had uh, we had tubular bells, we had uh, above the clouds. This mission was straight up, which was a Paula Abdul song. Uh, it was awesome having Paula with us a couple of days before launch up in Mojave, um, and she got to. Uh, wish the rocket well and honestly that that gave us some extra lift no pun intended um, you, you've <laughs> talked about looking into uh different business verticals dan uh beyond space launch um you know there's other, other verticals like hypersonics and data solutions so what are your plans there and how important are these verticals to the growth of your company well you know you mentioned two sort of very different sides of it so i'll touch both sides of that so number one Besides doing space launch, we can, we can accelerate things really fast, um, which is what you do in space launch, of course. Um, and so as, a, as we watch the US um, you know, drive forward in hypersonics R&D and development, you know, clearly a system like ours can, can serve uh, the test bed and, and provide capability pretty easily and at an attractive price. Similarly, the Missile Defense Agency, I mean, I spent about eight years on missile defense, uh, uh, shooting at targets uh, uh, on the GMD system, usually from Kwajalein. Um, and targets are a big part of that. And so the ability to uh, provide targets is, is a natural um, you know, for a system like ours. Uh, then on the other side, as you mentioned, you know, services. I mean, we're in the midst of discussions across the sector uh, with organizations like yours, uh, commercial organizations providing every phenomenology uh, known to humankind and, and maybe then some. Um, and, and we can both be a service provider for launch, but we can also be a partner given a lot of our ties, a lot of our ties across Virgin, across the world, um, and, and, and provide a, another distribution channel by taking some of their capability, maybe augmenting it, 
adding some analytics and supporting customers. So the, the, the space services side has always been a very, very vital, vibrant uh, part of the industry. Um, we want to participate in that um, and we want to help our customers participate in that. Well, clearly it's all about innovation and a willingness to take on new challenges and things are looking uh, up for or uh, Virgin Orbit. Uh, Dan, it's been a pleasure to speak with you today. It's, it's always a pleasure and uh, look forward to more partnerships in the future. Thanks for being here. Thank you. It's great chatting with you, Jason, and it's great to be on the, the Innovation Summit. Have a great day.